Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, this is um, really the, I guess, the third study we're doing specifically on Re Revelation 12. Um, obviously, we've been studying Daniel's last vision. And uh, the reason why we're studying Revelation 12 has to do with some of the uh, the understanding of that vision. And so, um, so we always have to keep that in mind. Anyway, before we begin this study, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the time that we have this morning to open your word together, and we invite your spirit's presence to enlighten our minds and to work upon our hearts uh, that we can receive whatever it is that you want to, to teach us. We know often we are seeking an understanding intellectually, but we just ask Lord that uh, the message will reach also our heart. That we can see our need of you and that we can confess our sins and forsake them. We pray for those watching these videos. We know Lord that um, the Holy Spirit is working upon hearts all around the world, but various ministries in different ways. We're just thankful, Lord, that we can play a part in these final events of Earth's history, and that you can use us even in these little ways. Uh, we pray, Lord, for those who have hard hearts. I know I receive emails from many people who are highly critical and unaware of their own sins. We just pray, Lord, that we cannot be like that, that we can see our sins first, and not the sins of others. Be with us now as we open your word together, is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> um, well, good morning, everyone. So there's been a lot of views on, on this study on YouTube, which is rather interesting. And um, I have had received emails from people, and there's been comments on some of the videos. You can probably see some of them. Um, one of the things I've noted in my life is there's a lot of difference between somebody discussing a theological point or an interpretation of scripture, which uh, is what we are supposed to do. We're supposed to discuss the scriptures, but often people will resort to, resort to uh, judging the character of the one presenting things. And we're all really easy targets. I'm an easy target. If you want to criticize my character, there's probably lots of things that you could criticize. But the one thing I've noticed about myself, when I'm critical of others, it's often because it's some defect in my own character that I see in others. And so I don't mind if people criticize me, but I do care about the people who are so prone to see uh, the faults in other people I may not recognize that it's something about them. Of course, that's not always an easy thing to take. Um, so, so it's just the thought, you know, that to, for people to keep in mind, so that when you see yourself being critical of someone, when I see myself being critical of someone, instead of actually addressing the scriptures, that I'm just critical of the person, then I need to take a long, hard look at myself and try to figure out why I'm doing that. Anyway, as we go into this study, um, we've been reading uh, Uriah Smith's uh, paper that he wrote, uh, a little booklet or tract uh, regarding Revelation 12, 13, and 17. And we're doing this because we're trying to understand the pioneer's view. And Uriah Smith is presenting the pioneer's view, but a lot of arguments that you don't find if you're going to read Miller or Josiah Lynch. One is Uriah Smith is writing a lot later, and, and he's developed some arguments that he's using. We can see that some of his arguments are not really valid, right? So he tends to do things, as I said before, um, sort of he's, he's arguing uh, uh, from a point where he is presenting his argument in its strongest sense without recognizing the weaknesses of his argument. And he misrepresents arguments that he's refuting. 
That is, he, he doesn't bring the strongest arguments of others. He tries to find the weakest arguments of others. So this is this polemical in, uh, way of writing that is very typical of Uriah Smith. And the first time I noticed this with Smith was uh, the book he wrote um, on the state of the dead. Uh, I'm trying to think what the title is. I could probably find it here quickly. Um, but the thing about it is the state of the dead is something so easy to show in scripture. And um, uh, so I'm just going to find it here. And I can probably tell you a bit more about this article, too, if I look here. Um, let me see. Um, and, and you'll find this if you just read anything that Uriah Smith has written. So this book, of this, this article is called uh, The Seven Heads of Revelation 12, 13, and 17. And it was written... Um, and let's see if they have a date for it. Um, there's, yeah, they don't even have the date for it. So I'm not sure when he wrote it. This is just on the EG white disc. Um, and his other book, Here and Hereafter, that book, I just found it was, if I was a person who was looking into the state of the dead and I'd come across that book and read it, I would have a pretty bad taste in my mouth in reading that book. I wouldn't have found it um, very palatable. And we know that the truth is supposed to be sweet in the mouth, right? It might be bitter in the belly, but, but the truth is shouldn't be uh, bitter in the mouth. And so if, if we presenting something in a way that is, is sort of in this argumentative, uh, accusatory, uh, belittling, mocking manner, that's not the manner in which Christ uh, presented truth. And so this is a criticism I have of Smith, just because my personal experience in reading him. And, and we can see that in his arguments, the types of arguments that he uses, they're not the best types of arguments. It's not really open, looking at the information and allowing the reader to make decisions. He's manipulating, right? He's trying to manipulate your decision process. And we should never do that. And sometimes we do, right? I've done it. I'm sure all of us have done it at times. We want to get the person to agree with us, but it's not really um, uh, the purpose because a person is who's convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. We've all heard that. So anyway, just that's just an aside from some of the stuff that I've seen uh, discussed regarding uh, these studies. Okay, so... Uh, and just a quick review of what we've done so far. So in Revelation 12, so we first on Sunday, we went through and said, here's what we need to understand. We need to understand Revelation 12, 13 and 17 in connection with the eight is of the seven. That is, we were looking at the first seven kings of Persia. And we know that those kings of Persia have been used as a model. They connect, they're connected with the seven thunders of Millerite history. And we look at the, the last seven kings of Judah. So really, first, we have the seven thunders of Millerite history. Secondarily, we then had the last seven kings of Judah. And those last seven kings of Judah caused us to look at the first seven kings of Persia. And then as we got deeper into Daniel in, in this movement, uh, Daniel chapter 11, we started to realize that Daniel 11 verse 40, 45 had uh, that that history is typified in the earlier histories, the battles of the kings of the north and the kings of the south. And, and connected with that was this understanding that Daniel chapter 11 verse 1 and 2 are going to be addressing this uh, uh, these these kings of Persia, which we already had, and then we could see that they could relate to presidents of the United States. So this this is a rather you know controversial view. How do we do that? 
So when we look back at the foundation, when we look at how the pioneers understood Daniel chapter 12, 13, and 17, the question is, does their understanding, does it mesh with the understanding that we have presently? Or is there something at fault with our understanding? Or maybe something lacking in the understanding of the pioneers? They made some mistake on this matter. And um, some people want to just go back to the understanding of pioneers and ignore everything else that has come after. And, and we can see that if God has been leading this church, that we should see that new light is an unfolding of established truth, that is the understanding of the pioneers, should in some way connect with what we understand today. Even if they didn't understand it completely, you can't just say what they understood was wrong. They did make mistakes, but those mistakes are always providential and they always, those mistakes actually, the understanding of those mistakes adds to the light that we have. That is, we can see why they made a mistake and how that mistake then being corrected is in God's providence. The best example we have of that is the mistake in interpreting First, the year 1843, as the end of the 2300 days, there was a mistake in some of the figures, and that was corrected. Christ held his hand over a mistake in the figures in the right hand, top right hand corner of the 1843 chart. But also in their, their belief that it was the earth that was to be cleansed with fire uh, at the end of the 2300 days, not recognizing that this cleansing was the heavenly sanctuary. So, so mistakes were made, but these mistakes were in God's providence. They weren't just mistakes. And I think we make a mistake when we just think we can go back and correct the pioneers um, without stand, understanding what the purpose was in how they looked at things. I hope that makes sense to people, right? Because we have these two extremes, people who just reject the foundation of Adventism as full of error, and then people who try to go back to the foundation as if it is perfect in the sense of there is no mistakes. Now, we know that the foundation was laid perfectly when we examine it, but why is it that our examination of it shows that it was laid perfectly? What have we found when we examine the foundation that it was laid perfectly? How is it, even though there was mistake, how is it that we can show it was laid perfectly? I know that's a rather broad question. Because to some people that would be contradictory. They had made mistakes, but the foundation was laid perfectly. So how do we explain that? Well, there, there's things like the, the prophecy of Josiah Litch that when we look at it, that he was doing things what he shouldn't have done, but we find out that he was correct according to the biblical date, so the 26th day of the fourth month, being a 381 year period, going to the next 26th day of the fourth month. So things that gets here when we have these here, objection, uh, what's the word? Uh, not objection, but <laughs> observational. Uh, Okay, never mind, just go on observational. Um, is it, there is a word I'm looking for. It's, it's, uh, it's not subjective, it's objective. Is that, I think that's what I'm trying to say. Objective, objective. objective yes, facts. So objective facts, which they were ignorant of, but we can actually see that correlates with what they, uh, that what they did turned out to be... Um, just object objectively clear in, in the sense of perhaps I'm trying to say something like that. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, okay, so what you're saying is with Josiah Litch, there, a criticism of his is why didn't he begin since, you know, since uh, uh, July 27th, 1299 is on the Julian calendar. Why is he going to count 15 days from July 27th on the Gregorian in, in 1840? Right. And 
And so criticism is he's wrong. He should have done this differently. And, and so, but when we examine the foundation, we actually notice things that the pioneers themselves didn't notice. That is from their perspective, uh, they couldn't have seen what we see now, right? There's no way they could have seen those things. They didn't have the tools, for instance, with the calendar uh, to recognize the 26th day of the fourth month on the biblical calendar was marked in all of these different dates, both in 1299, in 1449, in 1809, in uh, 1839 and 1840. They, they couldn't see that. And, and so we can look back at the foundation, examine it, and find it was laid correctly. But also in finding that, we have light then for the present, right? And even in some of their mistakes, like how they understood um, Daniel 11, verse 40, we can look back at that and see that that was in God's providence. They weren't able to recognize what we can recognize now because there's there's no way it would have had meaning to them but we can also see that we repeat the same mistakes that they do that we we do some of the same errors we take you know something that should be understood spiritually and we apply it literally and we should be consistent and if we don't recognize that then we're doomed to repeat mistakes yeah yeah so so we've been given this history to help us to recognize our mistakes and correct them. So to me, this is, is an important point um, in understanding Millerite history. Now, we've also understood so much about Millerite history that the Millerites could not have been aware of. Samuel Snow's letters, the dates of his letters, uh, they couldn't have seen the significance in it. And, and even though they, they had counted the first day of the first month, they never thought about which day was the Passover, or they did think about which day was the Rosh Hashanah right? October 13th um, in 1844 to get to the 22nd of October as being the 10th day of the first month. Um, and they did mark that as, as a close of probation, a shut door, um, which later they moved to October 22nd itself. But the point is they could not have understood what we understand. So when we examine the foundation, we see it was laid correctly, but it gives light for the present. And so all of this that we see in the past has to be accepted. So I'm not comfortable with just saying, well, we understand Daniel um, or Revelation 12, 13, and 17 differently. And so we should just say that, that the pioneers were wrong. No, there may be something in here in understanding the pioneers, understanding that will help us in the applications that we've made, because I do believe that God has led in our application of Revelation 17, you know? So one is we can't just ignore God's leading in the past, but we also can't ignore God's leading in the present. Now, sometimes we have to be corrected in some way, um, but not completely. We can't, we can't throw away everything that God has given us, um, which sometimes people want to do. They want to say, well, you know, we were disappointed in July 18, 2020. Um, so let's go back to some earlier point in our history. But we know if we start pulling on that thread, uh, the whole fabric <laughs> unravels. And not just for this movement, but, and, but also for Adventism and also for Christianity. Right. So, you know, sometimes people, I've seen them go all the way back as they start to pull on those threads, they go all the way back to Judaism and, and reject everything of Christianity in the end um, to some kind of Judaism, right? Might be like some kind of Messianic Judaism of, of some sort, you know, like some kind of things about Christ. But even then, if, if you they were consistent, some, the most consistent ones, just go back to nothing. They just go back to the world because they're consistent doesn't mean that that's right, but they're consistent in what they're doing. Anyway, that's the bit of the preamble here dealing with this. So we're, we're going to look here at um, Uriah Smith now addressing the heads more specifically. Um, 
So he's talking about the, the beast of Revelation 12. He says, this was at first a spiritual power. It had no crowns upon it, uh, for the power had now passed over to the horn. So, um, so he's saying that, uh, that this, and I'm not sure what he means by spiritual power. So if you just go back here, you can see what he's talking about. Um, the 10 horns represent the 10 kingdoms up out of Rome that came up out of Rome. And these all arose while the empire was still pagan. But almost immediately, the religion of the empire changed from paganism to that mongrel form of Christianity. Okay, so I think he's actually talking about the papers here. Sorry about that. This was at first a spiritual power. It had no crown upon it, for the power had now passed over to the horns. Okay, so he's saying the crowns are not upon the heads in the Beast of Revelation 13, but they're upon the horns. To maintain the unity of the symbol of the dragon, he had seven crowns upon his heads, but to main the, maintain the unity or the consistency of the symbol under the change, all the heads of the leopard beast now have blasphemy written upon them. So what he's referring to here, and this is one detail that I hadn't really thought about, um, but in Revelation 13, 1, he says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having said seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So this is a little detail I, I didn't really think about before. Um, so in the Beast of Revelation 12, the heads have crowns, but he's saying now the crowns are being passed to the horns, but the heads have hot upon them the name of blasphemy. Okay, so that's a detail we never really addressed uh, yet, but we didn't really go through Revelation 13 in detail yet. Okay, so he says, no heads appear after this with a crown upon it, and this shows that there's no other head to be developed to receive a crown after the civil power had passed to the horns. But it will be said, was not the papacy clothed with civil power? The papacy, to be sure, subjected uh, the civil power to itself. So that means it made it its subject, right? So the civil power was in control of the papacy. But the relation of religion to the state was not the same as it was under paganism. There, the emperor was Pontifus Maximus because he was the emperor. He held his religious office because of his civil office. But here, the popes assume civil authority because of their religious power. They presumed to control both the civil and spiritual affairs of men, not because they were emperors, but because they were God's vicegenerates upon the earth. Um, that is, one assumed control of the spiritual interest of his subjects because of his civil elevation. The other reversed the relation and assumed control of both the civil and spiritual interests of all men because of his spiritual elevation. That was the difference. It was this spiritual tyranny that constituted the special phase of, of the great Roman Colossus under the papacy. Hence, this head has no crown upon it, but is covered with the names of blasphemy. It is agreed on all hands that the papacy constitutes one of the heads and it is shown by what is here presented in reference to the crowns and horns that the head is absolutely the last in the series of the seven. So let's look at what he is saying. So what is he saying? That, that, that's actually quite interesting. The difference between the beast in Revelation 12 and the beast in Revelation 13 is what? So we've discussed it, but what is he saying? How, what is he saying about this? Somebody can put it into their own words. Well, he's saying that the uh, the heads. So these are not just the papacy, but they apply to the others who would take on the role of Pontifex Maximus and so forth. That they themselves versus God, such as Augustus, maybe declaring that he was a god and so, that type of thing, or Caesar. Mm -hmm. So okay. applying apply to the pagan powers as well. Okay. As to the... Yeah. Okay. Go on. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah, you're cutting out a little bit there, so so I, I try to you know 
I just thought you were finished. But so when we go back here, so he's saying that under pagan Rome, that you have all of these heads. That is, the beast of Revelation 12, we recognize as pagan Rome. And he's saying the heads aren't Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan Rome, papal, etc. He's just saying the heads are the different forms of government. Now, these heads under paganism have crowns. Now, so there's there's a little bit, you know, to me, a part that's always confusing about this. Whether you're dealing with uh, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, etc., as the heads, or whether you take his view, and that would be, well, the heads all have crowns. So that means in the Beast of Revelation 12, as he's saying, it's referring to its civil power. And, be, and he's saying, because of its civil power, it, it then is assuming control of the religion of the state. But that's going to be true of all the heads in that beast, right? Whether it's even the papal head, or whether one of the heads is just the papacy, um, you know, papal Rome, you're still going to have all of the heads having crowns. So that means that beast of Revelation 12, while it represents pagan Rome, it's showing that all the heads have that same characteristic. You don't see some heads with crowns, some heads with names of blasphemy, right? All of the heads have crowns in the beast of Revelation 12. In the beast of Revelation 13, none of the heads have crowns. And he's saying because the power has passed to the horns, all of the heads then are going to be represented with names of blasphemy. Yet really it's only the papal head itself that could take upon itself the name of blasphemy, right? So it just means that we have these heads, but these heads in some way are different in the beast of Revelation 12 than they are in the beast of Revelation 13. Now we always notice they had no crowns, but I never thought about the name of blasphemy before being written upon them. So even though those heads could represent different things, either successions of forms of Roman government or successions of nations, when you get to Revelation 13, all of those heads are going to have the same characteristic. So how do we explain that? Any, anybody's willing to give an explanation? I mean, does it seem like a problem in, in, in our view of things? I know we're, we're thinking about it for the first time, so. So I guess what we could say about it, whatever the heads represent, when it's pagan Rome or when it's papal Rome, those heads constitute aspects of that beast. So for the view that the heads represent Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan Rome, papal, etc., that's very consistent with the idea that we have that Rome is the synchronistic power, that these are just showing that that beast has the aspects of those kingdoms. Now, would it be true that the papal power has all the aspects of the different forms of Roman government? Because you have Revelation 13, you have seven heads. One of them is the papal head. But all the other heads are going to have names of blasphemy. And, and if these were the different forms of Roman government, are those tied to the papacy?
Is there any way that we could attach all these different forms of Roman government to the papacy? I mean, in my estimation, the little I know about all how Roman government operated and how, uh, whether it's pagan or papal, um, could, could we say that? Maybe this has something to do with the structure of the Roman church with its, uh, you know, cardinals and bishops. Maybe there's some parallel there to the different forms of government that existed in Rome. Okay, so okay. yeah, in, okay. in your, to answer or attempt, attempt to answer your question. Mm -hmm. We have the different forms of Roman government mm -hmm. yet can we align this as a pattern with the messages of the three angels of revelation 14 okay so we're saying the seven heads align with the seven thunders that, that can be as well yes okay so <clears throat> if we're looking at this as a pattern we should be able to find elements of all of the types of Roman government within this that becomes the papacy. Right. That's the question I'm asking. Now, I can easily see how the kingdoms, Babylon, Beda, Persia, Greece, and Rome, all those have its characteristics in the papacy. Right? Right. But I don't know as much about the different forms of Roman government. I mean, I can read the words decimers, but I don't know what that is. You know, I don't, don't understand that form of Roman government or how that would apply to the papacy if we were going to examine its form of government. But the question, this question that we still have and, and is that even when you're looking at papal, pagan Rome as the beast of Revelation 12, if we're saying one of the heads is a form of Roman government that's still future, which is the papal form. Well, the papal form isn't part of pagan Rome, right? And yet it still has that head, right? So, so this, this to me, just from my, my analytical perspective is something that needs to be answered. How do we answer that question? How do we answer that the beast of Revelation 12 has seven heads. And one of those heads is the papacy, right? Well, I mean, or it's just a papal form of Roman government. You know, uh, so one way that we could look at it from the way that I understand the kingdoms of Bible prophecy is it's easy to show that there, the last power is Rome, even though it has this divided nature, these heads. And so, in Revelation 12, that's pagan Rome. It has all of the heads in that creature, even though some of those are still future, right? That would, you know, so we're going to say in, in the time of, of John, the time the vision is given, you wouldn't say five are fallen because these are, or these, these nations. So you'd have Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, you'd be in the time of Rome, you'd say three are fallen. But we're saying that later on, it, the five are fallen are going to apply, right? That's that's the view that we hold in this movement presently. Um, so that, that would be consistent with the idea of Daniel chapter two, that there's four kingdoms, or even Daniel chapter seven, that there's four kingdoms. You know, the last kingdom has a little horn come out of it and so forth, about speaking blasphemy, you know seeks the same change times and laws all those types of things so you can see there is a consistency in how we have understood that the heads are the different nations of bible prophecy it's harder for me to take that that that's the forms of roman government but maybe there is a way in which we can do it okay, okay. donald do you have a comment yeah uh what i wanted to say was uh from the, I went through this document uh, the time that it was just posted way back, and mm -hmm. uh, when I went through it, uh, Rome uh, it was uh, changing because uh, when you look at uh, Truvelion, that was the time that Rome was uh, being ruled by three, three people. Yeah, the Trump Yeah. Yes, 
and with uh, this uh, this what that word that was the time that Rome was ruled by ten people, meaning they all had the same powers. All of yeah, them. Yeah, the decimal that there's ten, ten, ten emperors, yes. and ten leaders. Yeah, that that was a way yes, yes. to, to uh, uh, disseminate the authority so that there wouldn't be uh, so much power in one person. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so the question is, like, these are different ways in which the government operated in the time of pagan Rome. Can we apply that to papal Rome, that these different forms of government occurred? Now, I know we do have, like, what they call the Black Pope and the White Pope. So you got the Black Pope is, is the head of the Jesuits and the White Pope is just the, you know, the Pope, right? Um which would be two different groups, whether there's a third in there, um, I don't know. But, you know, so under Papal Rome, I, I just don't know a lot. That's the one book of A.T. Jones that I never got through um, was um, uh, whatever, it's called Ecclesiastical Empire or something like that. It's the history of the Roman Catholic Church. I, I got like part of the way through that book, but it was rather dry i probably need to read it again um but yeah so to understand the form of roman government if this if it's true my view is that you would need all of those forms of roman government pagan in the pagan rome to be operating in the time of the papacy maybe i'm wrong in saying that that, it, that it's a requirement but to me it seems to be that way but that those seven heads, it, to me, it's more consistent with them being the kingdoms of Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome, etc. In how, in how I understand these these prophecies, when we deal with the beast of Revelation thirteen, I do, however, think that with the beast of Revelation twelve it is consistent to have them to be the seven forms of Roman government. Because we can see that the papacy is a continue, continuation of pagan Rome, but in a different form, that being one of the heads that's still going to be um, future from the time of the emperors, is consistent with Revelation 12 being the forms of Roman government, but it's not consistent with the heads in Revelation 13 as being the forms of Roman government. And so the, the, the argument that I put forth or the view that I put forth is that because you have these two different beasts, even though they're similar, we wouldn't argue that the heads in the beast of Revelation 13 are the same things in Revelation 12. In Revelation 12, they have crowns. In Revelation 13, they don't have crowns and have the names of blasphemy written upon it. And if we look at them as these kingdoms, then it's easy to see how that blasphemy does exist in each of these kingdoms. It's going to be manifest in its strongest way with the papal power. I don't know what people think of that view, but that to me seems to be the best way to look at it because the beasts are different to just try to say, well, the heads must be the same things in each of the beasts uh, is a problem. Also that the horns must be the same thing in all of these beasts, that the 10 horns are always the same thing. 10 is a symbol of the world. But at different times, those 10 horns can represent something differently. Now, Uriah Smith says if we have them represent something differently, then we add them up at the end of the world. But I think it's very consistent to say uh, that there is 10, and those 10 can represent different things with the different beasts. But ultimately, they do represent the world. But when it comes to the time of the papacy, it's going to represent uh, the divisions of the world, that is Western Europe, with 
the nations that have conquered Western Europe, the tribes that conquered it, that developed those nations in Western Europe. But we wouldn't in, in uh, Revelation 12 say, well, those 10 horns must then be the divisions of, of Europe as those nations, right? They, they could be something else, right? I'm not saying that, that it's maybe it's how they're divided. Uh, but when we get to Revelation 17, we've taken the position that the 10 horns are the United Nations. Well, the United Nations don't just comprise Europe. They comprise the whole world in the very almost literal sense, right? And there isn't 10, but we use the symbol 10 to represent the world. Any thoughts on this? Donald, you have a uh, what of, uh, Yeah, what of, uh, have we ever looked on, uh, looking on the, the way the, the UN is, uh, has been put in place, where we find that there's uh, the G7, G8, looking on uh, that aspect, I don't know. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. We, we, we try to find some kind of literal division that we can apply either to the heads or to the horns. Right, some kind of number. If the world is divided up into ten parts by somebody, whether it's the papacy or or the UN or or somebody. If, if it's divided up in that way, I don't think we need a literal application of the number ten, though. That is, ten is a symbol of the world, right? It's yes. Right, three is a symbol of of completion, right? but completion differently than seven is. Seven is also a symbol of completion, but more perfection, right? right. So three is kind of like a symbol of unity. Seven is a symbol of perfection, um, you know, spiritualistically, like, like in complete perfection type of in character perfection. Um, 10 is a completion of the world and 12 is a symbol of the completeness of the church, right? Because of the 12 sons of Jacob. 12 tribes, right? The 12 disciples, right? So each of these has this symbol of completeness. Um, so the symbol is the important part, doesn't literally have to be there. Um, you know, at the end of the world, you don't need 10 divisions of the world for 10 to represent the world. Correct. Okay. So, but when we're, when we're going back here, so the main point, I had trouble with years ago, even before, you know, I was in this movement, was trying to understand the 10 toes, the 10 horns, are they always the same thing? And uh, Parminder tried to uh, attack this. He tried to, you know, muddy the waters on this point um, with, um, with his view of uh, Daniel chapter two. So, so with Daniel chapter two, um, you know, he tried to say, well, you know, these 10 toes always, you know, if they they always have to be the same thing. And so he went to a type of preterist view and we see that Jeff is kind of adopting that view of Daniel chapter two. Now, in, so, so we have a choice. We can say that the 10 toes always re represent the same thing. They always represent divided Europe, but divided Europe literally doesn't exist at the second coming, right? I mean, I know when I first became an Adventist, you go to evangelistic series, they talk about the Daniel chapter two, they talk about uh, the, the clay and the iron, how they don't mix together. This is the mingling of the seeds of men. And so they talk about how, uh, the intermarriage that happened between the kings of Europe, but they would never unite. Like you can't have Europe unite. Of course, the European Union now exists, right? So 
So, so in some ways they're trying to unite, but this whole thing was, well, you know, and when they unite, that's when Jesus is going to come back because, uh, you know, they can't cleave one to another. And so they'll just have this sort of type of union that happens with the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet all uniting. So these are types of views that were presented in evangelistic series. Because the ten toes would have to represent Europe at the end of the world. So they tried to make it always consistent that it was always Europe. But we know that at the end, we apply this to the United Nations, which isn't just Europe. We apply it to the whole world. So there's, there was always this inconsistency that I could never really reconcile. And I'm not sure if I fully understand it yet, but I do have a better understanding of what these beasts are. And that we would have to say that the 10 in these different beasts, pagan Rome, papal Rome, and modern Rome, are not always exactly the same thing. The heads don't then have to be exactly the same heads, right? That, that's what I'm suggesting. So, so let's go on and read this here again, um, this, this next paragraph that we started on. Okay, so the action of the dragon in reference to the following, or leopard beast, still further shows that the dragon as a symbol is confined to pagan Rome, right? So you have the leopard beast and you have the dragon. The dragon is pagan Rome. The dragon gives to the papal beast his seat, his power, and great authority. His seat was Rome, which has been occupied by the popes ever since it was abandoned by the emperors. And this, as a matter of history, was a transaction wholly between pagan and papal Rome. Now, uh, didn't the papacy move from Rome to, um, what's the name of the other place there? I mean, maybe it always had Rome as well, but what was the other place where? Uh, it went to uh, Avignon for about 60 odd years. Yeah, so yeah. So how far is that from, from Rome? That's in France, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah so uh, I mean, maybe I'm just being much. a little picky here, but. What's that? Yeah, probably about 300 miles, maybe. Okay. Yeah, so for a short time, they moved it. Um, but yeah, generally, would say that it's still the seat of Rome. I mean, Rome was still there, and even though the papacy wasn't there, um, you know, they still had aspects of, Rome, of of the papacy that had part of Rome. But, but anyway... Um, no, so maybe, you know, he's just talking in a general sense. There's always an exception to the rule here. His seat was Rome, which had been occupied by the popes ever since it was abandoned by the emperor, emperors. This is a matter of history, was a transaction wholly between pagan and papal Rome. So we know that pagan Rome gave to the papacy its power, its seat, Rome, and great authority, which, of course, was not its to give. Um so this is a matter of prophecy wholly between the dragon and the leopard beast. The dragon, therefore, represents pagan Rome and the beast, papal Rome. Neither Babylon, Medo, Persia, nor Greece had anything whatever to do with the transfer of the papacy, as they must have had, if they, were, if they constituted three of the heads of the dragon. Therefore, the conclusion again follows that the seven heads of the dragon cannot take in those ancient empires. So you can see he's arguing against himself. Because if the seven heads dip, represent different forms of Roman government, which form of Roman government passed the, the seat to the papacy? Did the Republican form of Roman government pass its seat to the papacy? That was uh, the emperor. Right, the emperors, right? So you can say, well, how, so he could say exactly the same thing about the forms of Roman government as he could say about uh, the different kingdoms of Bible prophecy. Now his argument is, well, they're, they're still all part of pagan Rome, right? But yet those heads, it says exists in pagan Rome. And, and so but we can also say the Babylon, Medo, Persia, and Greece also exist within pagan Rome because those attributes had been 
um, brought into pagan Rome. They have the attributes of Babylon, attributes of Babylon, and Amina Persia, and of Greece. We're not saying that the beast of Revelation 12 is the government of Babylon still, or the kingdom of Babylon, or the kingdom of Medo Persia, or the kingdom of Greece, but that it has those heads that represent those characteristics of those preceding nations. And since it's the imperial Rome that gives the papacy its power, seat, and great authority, that gives the leopard beast that, you can't you you can say just as he's saying about here well you know the decimers didn't exist at that time and you know the republican rome didn't exist at that time the dictators didn't do it it was constantine he's an emperor so now you can say yes it's pagan rome of course but the head that does it isn't isn't what all of the seven heads, right? It's only one of the heads that has it. So, yes. uh, yeah. Ted, Ted, Constantine, yeah. give that. Was it him that gave the papacy that power, that seat? Because yeah. that's what the papacy claimed for. There's an odd year for the donation of Constantine, which was a forgery. So, was yeah, it not so you, maybe, I was thinking okay. more at the time of Julius, uh, of the uh, Eastern Rome, uh, yeah. Julius, oh. so, Julian, or? Right, so, so there is a forged document called the Donation of Constantine, and this document is created in the time of Justinian, right, I believe, and they tried to show that the, the, that it was Constantine that passed uh, this to to Rome. Now, now, there's a number of things. Obviously, we know the documents is forged, but we do know that Constantine did move his capital from Rome to uh, by uh, to what was called uh, Byzantinium, right? Which later was named uh, Constantinople by him, and then later became Istanbul, right? So, so the donation of Constantine tries to give legitimacy to that. But we can say in some sense that it still did happen under Constantine, even if we don't have a document to show it. Now, so, so the papacy assumed that, but by assume, not like making a, a, an assumption, but in the sense of took it over, over time. But definitely Rome was, that seat of Rome uh, was taken over by the bishops of Rome. And that only could have occurred if Constantine moved his capital from Rome to Constantinople, right? So, you know, people understand Stephen's point that the donation of Constantine is a forged document, didn't, didn't occur, made in the time of Justinian to give excuse for setting up the papal power in the way that it did? I think it was later than that. I think it was near around the 800s. Okay, so late 100s? okay, maybe late. Okay, so the document was forged. Yeah, you're right. It's for, formed in the ninth century. Okay. I'm trying, I was trying to remember when it was, when it was forged. Um, but the point is, Constantine did move his capital from Rome to Constantinople, and that gave way for the papacy to take over Rome, right? Okay. So as far as his argument is concerned here, because um, we were just talking about Constantine uh, giving it since the time of the emperors, uh, that that the the 
pagan Rome is going to give the papal beast uh, his power, seat, and great authority, right? Um, we still have this problem. If one of the heads in pagan Rome is the papacy, that is the papal form of government, does the papal form of government exist in pagan Rome? Elements of it, <clears throat> elements of it, yes. Well, well, we couldn't say, we couldn't say that if pagan Rome, because pagan Rome is defined as ending in 508, and this is the Roman power, and, and then the next form of Roman government is going to be the papacy. It's not until the papacy takes its form, its its role, its form of government, right? It's fine, the papacy exists, but the papal government doesn't exist until 538, right? As far as part of, of it definitely is not part of pagan Rome. All I'm saying is that his argument that the heads must constitute forms of Roman government, his arguments against that uh, it is, is against this, this being this kingdoms is that these kingdoms didn't exist. But in pagan Rome, papal, the papal form of government didn't exist because it follows after pagan Rome. So by very definition, the papal form of government can't be a part of pagan Rome. So it could not be one of the heads of pagan Rome. If his argument, the way he's making his argument is correct. So he's arguing against himself both on the forms of government that are going to follow in pagan Rome and also the forms of government that exist before. So, so to me, this argument that those heads um, can't be nations, his argument that he's making would also argue against it being seven forms of Roman government. So that's all I'm saying is that the argument itself is arguing against him. So, so his conclusion that follows that the seven heads of the dragon cannot take in those ancient empires also would have to say that the seven heads cannot be the seven forms of Roman government because they didn't all exist in pagan Rome. That is, the papal form didn't exist in, pa in, in pagan Rome, at least. We could also say the other ones had nothing to do with it either, with what's being talked about. Okay. So I don't see a good argument here against the idea that these are king the kingdoms of Bible prophecy are represented in the leopard-like beast. Now, the one thing he hasn't addressed at this point is um, the leopard-like beast has all the characteristics of those preceding nations, right? It has the characteristics of Greece. It's a leopard-like beast. It has the feet of a bear. It's That's going to be Medo-Persia. And it has the mouth of a lion. That's going to be Babylon, right? Correct. So, so it has all of these characteristics, and um, the feet is bare, mouth of the lion. The dragon gave him his power, feet, feet and great seat and great authority. Right. So you can see, uh, it has Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and the dragon power, which we say is pagan Rome, has given him his power, seat and great authority. So it has all of the preceding four beasts in it. The papacy is just uh, paganism clothed in Christian garb. So you can easily see how the beast of Revelation 13, that the heads can represent all these nations, these kingdoms of the world, the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. But in Revelation 12, 
you can see that that dragon beast it represents pagan Rome. And one of those heads can be the papal power because it's an aspect that even though it isn't formed in the time of pagan Rome, it's still an aspect of Rome because papal Rome is pagan Rome dressed up in Christian garb. So you can include that head in that. But I wouldn't, in my view, attach Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan Rome, papal, the United States, the UN, in the Beast of Revelation 12. So I would say the Beast of Revelation 12, that the seven heads are different than they are in the Beast of Revelation 13. That here, it's very consistent to say that these heads represent the different kingdoms of Bible prophecy, because the beast itself shows that. And any thoughts on that idea? I could take your silences that nobody agrees with me. Well, okay, I'm I'm trying to consider what you said. I I don't know that I have a a comment at this point. Well, could we say it would be consistent? That's possible. Yeah. Because we know the beasts are not are not the same beasts. We know one is pagan Rome, one is papal Rome. And, and easily we can see that one is referring to um, that, that the pagan Rome aspect is really about its civil authority. But the papacy is different because in pagan Rome, the seven heads have seven crowns. Right, There's seven crowns, one upon each of the heads. But in Revelation 13, they don't have crowns. They just have names of blasphemy. So in some ways, the heads represent that beast, pagan Rome, in its characteristics, even though all of those seven heads are not all the same. They still are going to keep that characteristic because in the time of pagan Rome, the heads have crowns. But when we get to the papacy, we're just going to look at the, the blasphemy aspect of those heads. And we can say that that blasphemy exists in Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and pagan Rome, as well as what's going to follow, right? All right. So for those, those heads now are representing the heads of papal Rome, that is the characteristics of papal Rome at that time. But papal Rome has incorporated the kingdoms of the past and influencing the kingdoms of the future. So it is a religious beast. When we get to Revelation 17, the papacy is not the beast at all. The papacy is riding a beast. And that, that beast there in Revelation 17 is what we call modern Rome. But again, it's representing more a civil power. But in this case, that civil power doesn't have crowns. And so that can represent at the end of the world where we don't have kings, right? We, th there's a change. We have these democracies that exist. Doesn't mean that they're really truly democracies, but at least in the form of what they profess, it's much different than the idea of kings or the forms of government that existed in the past. That's true. The democratic form of government did exist to some degree in uh, ancient times, but not in the type of way that we have today, right? So, so there are differences. We're just saying at the end of the world that, that Rome is now, it's not the beast, right? That this beast is, and it's not the composite beast of Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome, right? It doesn't have those characteristics of the beasts of Bible prophecy, but it still has the seven horns or seven heads and 10 horns. 
So it represents something different at the end of the world. And I don't know that we could then say, well, the seven heads are now either the seven forms of Roman government or the seven kingdoms of Bible prophecy. I'm not saying um, that it can't be those. I'm just saying that there's no reason that we would have to say it's one of those. Okay, Stephen? Yes. So I'm just identifying that you're as if you're saying that there won't there's no crimes because there's democracy. And isn't not the part of the heads that had a crown in the time of Revelation 12, the pagan realm? One of them was democracy. So there was a crown there on that head, but there's no crown at the end of the world. Right. So, so this point here, democracy. Yeah. So let's clarify that. So when we're looking at pagan Rome, we can see that each of those heads are different forms of government, and one is democracy, right? That's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. But yet, when we're looking at pagan Rome, the characteristic of pagan Rome is its civil authority comes from the heads, right? That that that's even what Uriah Smith is saying, and 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 that civil okay. authority is is going to control the religion in some way. When we get to um, Re Revelation thirteen. We well, now don't have crowns on the heads. The crowns are on the horns. And this and, and the, on the heads is the names of blasphemy. This is this religious power now controlling um, the civil power, right? These horns, the civil powers, these horns, these kingdoms that are now controlled by the papacy. And that's a characteristic of the papacy. It's not a characteristic of pagan Rome. So... So we know the heads then don't have to be the same heads. And the horns don't have to be the same horns. We still haven't really addressed what these 10 horns would be, though. I take them as, as the time in which John is, is the time of the emperor, right? And that those 10 horns would then be the, the first 10 emperors. That's my view, but we haven't examined that in detail yet. Um. But there's no reason that those horns have to be the same horns, and there's no reason that the heads have to be the same heads, because symbols can have more than one meaning. Now, the symbol of seven means something, and the symbol of ten means something. But it doesn't make sense to me to say that because there are seven heads in each of these beasts, the heads must be the same things, and because there's ten horns, the ten horns must be the same things. Right? That's all I'm saying. Whether I'm not saying that they can't be, I'm just saying that there's no reason that they must be. And so when we get to Revelation 17, we have made the assumption either that you know people have said, well, it's seven forms of Roman government all the way through, or it's seven uh, kingdoms of Bible prophecy all the way through. But but we have made an application in this movement, and, and there's no reason why you can't parallel the seven heads in Revelation 17 with the seven heads in Revelation 13 or with the seven heads in, because that's how we do it. That's line upon line. That is, if you place those things, they're going to give you information because it's a different line. But we have made the assumption that it's always the same heads and it's always the same horns. And yet we have made an application where now the heads are going to represent presidents of the United States and the horns are going to represent the UN, which really isn't the same as the 10 toes, right? The, the 10 kingdoms of Eastern Europe or however you want to look at it. And, and, and see, I don't take the position that the 10 toes in the image of Daniel chapter two are the 10 nations of Europe. Because they don't really exist at the second coming of Christ. They're just a symbol that can be applied in one point, in one history, as the ten divisions of Western Rome by these ten um, uh, 
uh, Germanic tribes that come in and conquer Rome. But so we've always just, this to me is the same problem when somebody sees 70 years, right? The 70 years are the days of one king, the 70 years that the land lies desolate, the 70 years for Babylon, or the 70 years in which uh, they fast in the seventh month and, and the tenth, uh, uh, the fifth month and the seventh month, right? The fast of the fifth and seventh month. And we just see 70 years and we say it's all the same. It must be the same period of 70 years. Or we see time times and a half or time times a dividing of time. And we say, well, that's 1260 years. It must be the same 1260 years in Daniel 725 or 12 or 7, right? We just assume that. That's just the way our brains work. We're going to see things that are the same in some way, and we just equate them as the same. But there is no reason we should do that here. There's no reason we should say that the beast of Revelation 17, that the heads are exactly the same heads as the beast of Revelation 13 or the beast of Revelation 12. That's all I'm saying, um, saying what they are. I'm just saying there's no reason to assume they are the same. Uh -huh. And that it means, I think, well, okay, go on. Okay, so could it be then that in 1798, and John's taken there in Revelation 17, mm -hmm. uh, that he's seeing these here as your beast, and they have no crowns on their heads or their horns either. And then you, you go to the seventh beast, uh, sorry, the seventh king, which is uh, to reign for a short time. It says that he has no. No king, he has no powers yet, but he will rule for an hour, or and then another space is a short space. Mm -hmm. So, so in 17, 1798, if that's applying to the United Nations, it hadn't any any crowns in the sense then in 1798, but it will for a short time, in the sense that even though there, there's no crowns mentioned, there's not these, but it maybe. Because it's, it's relating to 1798, but it will, M10 kings will, in a sense, have crowns. If they're a king, they'll have a crown. So there will be crowns, not in 1798, but at the end of the world, in the, oh. the seventh hour, when the United States ends and, and the United Nations takes over. Okay. So so what we can consider, I mean, you're looking at one option in, try, in trying to interpret it, this beast. Now, we know that the United States rises in 1798, right? And, and that can be seen in Revelation 13. You're going to see the United States as a separate beast from the papal beast, right? You're going to see the papal beast, you know, John's on the, the sand of the sea. He's going to look one direction. Right, he's he's going to um, see this beast, right? And let me see here. I know I always get it wrong. Right. So he stood upon the sand of the sea. He saw this beast rise up out of the sea. Right. So he's going to see this beast rising up out of the sea. That's you know the populated world. Right? This is going to be the papacy, right? It's the papal beast. And then he's going to see the beast rise up out of the earth, right? So he looks the other direction because he's on the sand of the sea, looks at the sea. So if he sees one riding, coming up out of the earth, he has to change directions and look. So he's going to see the second beast. And we know that's the United States. Now, when we get to Revelation 17, um, we see that there's the papacy riding a beast it's called the scarlet scarlet colored beast and he's carried away in the spirit into the wilderness well the wilderness would refer uh to to what what's the wilderness the 1260 okay yeah, so it's the 1260 so he's at 1260 and he's going to see this woman riding upon these this beast, which has seven heads and ten horns. Now, so this beast can't be the papacy. 
right? So it's not the papal beast, and and it's definitely not pagan Rome, right? So it's it's the kingdoms of this world, and and we know that this this brings us to this papacy, but this papacy is going to continue. First, there's the the seventy years of the days of one king. So we say that that applies to the United States. Tyre is, is um, going to be taken out of the way, right? I can't remember the words for it. Um, but then it's going to sing as a harlot at the end of the 70 years, right? And we say that that's the papacy. That, that is Tyre. The days of one king we apply to the United States. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so this is the period of time that we're brought to. We're brought to the end of the papal power, right? And we are mm -hmm. being, and and now we're going to be looking at the period of the United States. So, so, so this woman's riding this beast, but now this beast is a bit more comprehensive. Right, because it's going to apply to the end of the world as well. It's going to have seven heads, and it's going to have ten horns. Now, these ten horns um, are ten kings that have received no kingdom as yet. So we're going to say that's the UN, right? That's what you're saying. But they do receive yes. power in one hour with the beast. And this is very consistent with what we understand about Revelation 17. Now, we have made an application, when I say we, this movement has made an application of, of, of these heads, you know, specifically Colin, that these are the presidents of the United States. Now, uh, Joseph Bates, he makes an, un he has an understanding uh, where he places the eighth head as the United States. So he goes back to Revelation 13 and tries to make the case that it's the Republican form of government that arises um, as the eighth head, and that's under the United States, right? So, so he's gonna have them as forms of government. This movement has taken the position that the seven heads are Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, et cetera. And then um, uh, this eighth head is just going to be one of the heads, which was the papal form of government, right? So those those are, are basically these two, three views, I guess, right? So we're going to have, uh, in our movement, we have these two views, that is, we take the nations of Bible prophecy, and then we also apply it to, uh, to the, the kings of the United States as a secondary application of some sort. Now, is it possible that we are brought to a time that's a little bit different. That is, a, so the idea that the five are fallen, right? We've talked about last time about the time in which we place this. So that the time is either John's day, right? So if it's in John's day, then the five are fallen or the five forms of Roman government. If the explanation of the angel, because we know he's still brought into the future, but if the explanation of the angel is in the time of the United States, then the five that are fallen are Babylon, Media, Persia, Green, Greece, Rome, Pagan, and Papal. And the United States is the one that is. And then there's going to be another uh, that's going to come the seventh, which would be the UN. And then uh, the eighth is just the revival of the papacy combining with the United States and the UN in this threefold union in at the end of the world dealing with the Sunday law. So, so that's the view. But maybe there is something that we, we haven't understood about these heads, right? And about the time that we're brought to. Now, if we take Colin's understanding, um, we have to be sometime in our time, but these heads now are typified by Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, et cetera. But the heads are the presidents of the United States. So, and, and the whole reason we're looking at this is because of Colin's 
application in Daniel chapter 11, verse 1 to 3, right? So he's making this application. He's connecting that, saying that these, that we can take these uh, kings of Persia, you know, there shall yet three stand up in Persia, kings stand up in Persia, and the fourth, Xerxes, we know that he's Trump. We used that back in 2000, end of 2015 into 2016 to predict that Trump would become president of the United States, and it happened. Um, and so, so we've taken this view that uh, uh, Xerxes is Trump, and so, so we could then look at Revelation 17 and say these heads if they're the presidents of the United States, and we, we look at our time, we can make an application. The one is, is one of those presidents, right? We might have different ways in which we try to, to interpret that. Um, so the one is, is Trump, or different ways in which we count them. So, so the part of it, the problem that we've had here in this whole time is, we see that there's inconsistencies in how we take the seven kings of Persia, the last seven kings of Judah, and the presidents of the United States, and line them up in order to get a count where we know which one is the one is, right? Now, this idea that we're applying to the presidents of the United States has been variously applied to the popes. That is, people have made the same kind of arguments that we're making with the presidency of the United States. And they would go, well, we're going to count the prep popes from the Lateran Treaty. And um, so we're, we're, we're not going to be in, you know, 1798 when we're counting. In this case, we're going to be sometime in the future when we're counting, just like Colin is with his. He's not counting from 1798 with the presidents saying, five or fallen, he's counting from our time. Um, and so they're gonna count somewhere in our time, you know, either, you know, the one that is, is Pope John Paul II was how it was uh, at some, some point. So at different points, people have counted out different popes and tried to figure out, well, if we start from the Lateran tre Treaty, you know, we can count so many popes. I can't remember the whole thing. And then we looked at uh, Ralph Meyer, his, his interpretation that this wasn't really about individual popes, this was about the names of popes, right? So it was about the name. And, and so he looked at the different names of these different popes that have occurred since 1798. And then he added them up based upon this progression, just similar as when one plus, oh, one plus two plus three plus four from their numbers, added them all together and you get 666, you know, for the last pope, right? Um, so we looked at those in our study on presidents of the United States, and we're going to look at it again, actually, um, just to remind people. So when we get further into Revelation 17, but you can see here that, that it's not, it's not as simple as people are trying to make this out, right? We can't just go with what we already believed and not consider these things. And as we examine these things, I think we can all agree, we start to see things that we never saw before. And is that important, to see things we've never saw before? Is that what part of Bible study is? Yes. Yeah. So, because if we are going to blind our eyes, to seeing things new from God's word, uh, we are making an error. Now, we also have another error that we can make, and that is to ignore uh, what was taught in the past and just look for new things, something new and startling, right? Ellen White warns against this mistake because she says new light is an unfolding of old light. That is, when we have new light, Old light shines brighter. And that to me is just a principle that we have to have. And that when we can look at the past, we can receive new light, but that new light is gonna make us understand the past much better. We're gonna, we're gonna have a clearer comprehension 
of what the pioneers taught. We're going to have a clear comprehension of the foundation of this message. We're going to have a clear understanding of the prophecies of Scripture, of the words of Christ, a clear understanding of the gospel, a clear understanding of our sinful condition, a clear understanding of what God wants us to do in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's not going to set us up when we, when we receive new light. It will never put us in opposition to individuals. It'll never place us above others, right? That's not what new light is meant to do. Often people have new light. I've seen lots of it. The new light is, uh, consists of criticizing other people who don't understand truth and exalting themselves because they do understand truth. Just because we understand truth, it doesn't make us better than someone else. And, and we also have to be aware that the understanding of truth is meant to do something to us and that makes us to criticize ourselves, not make us criticize others, right? So we've taken a lot of time here looking at just a very little bit of Uriah Smith's 35 page article. But we, we should be able to see here that um, there is a lot that we have not paid attention to in our study of Revelation 12, 13, and 17. So um, I'm just gonna read a little bit more here because, well, we're almost out of time here. So this just kind of sums up things of what he was saying. But again, it may be asked, what had the other heads of Rome, which had passed away years before, to do with it? They had to do with it, of course, only as they had been a part of the Roman power, all included within its past history. When the transfer was made to the papacy, all the heads except the last proceeding had passed away, which must be the one as a matter of necessity to make the transfer. But that head represented all the Rome that had gone before. So they just say, he's saying that you need that papal head because it's all Rome. And, but you can see, again, he's sort of arguing against himself where he says you couldn't have Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, because we can say that about Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, that they're a succession of kingdoms. There would be no argument against those representing the heads in the papal beast or the leopard-like beast. It was not Rome when Constantine moved the seat. Of, was it not Rome when Constantine moved the seat of the empire to the Bosporus and left the city of Rome to become the seat of the popes? And was it not just as much Rome, the same Rome, when the proud Tarquins were expelled from the throne by an indignant populace nearly a thousand years before? But neither Babylon, Medo Persia, nor Greece were part of Rome and never have been, and consequently can sustain no claim to any in, to any relation with this transfer to the papacy of the seat of the ancient Caesars. But again, you can see how he could apply this to the beast of Revelation 12, but when it comes to the beast of Revelation 13, the beast of Revelation 13 is one of the heads of the beast of Revelation 12, according to Uriah Smith, right? It's the seventh head, according to Uriah Smith. And so, so there's no reason that the papacy, which is now this spiritual power, cannot have heads, especially since it's got all the characteristics of these kingdoms that will represent the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. So sometimes when a person argues, they argue too much against themselves. And, and Uriah Smith has not considered that maybe the heads in Revelation 12 are different than the heads in Revelation 13. And that's something we need to consider when we go ahead uh, later and look at Revelation 17. But we're going to start looking more at Revelation 13 here, especially when we get to the United States, because that's what his study is going to do. Okay. Any final comments before we close with prayer? Steve? I just thought this is connected with what you were saying there. With Revelation 13, with one of the, uh, the beast being also one of the seven heads mm -hmm. could not also you apply that then 
Revelation 17, like a woman being an aspect of the beast as well? That's where I still have the problem with the woman riding the beast, that one of the heads is is the same as the, the woman itself. I, that's where I've always had a problem with that interpretation. But but yeah, maybe maybe in some ways we can see that. But you can see, again, it's not as simple as people have made it out to be. So, okay. So thank you, Stephen, for that. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for what you have done um, in our lives and in these studies. And we just ask, Lord, that you can continue to bless them. Uh, thank you for the conversation and discussion we can have on these things. And I pray that you can be with each person as they continue to study on their own. I ask for your angels' care and protection. Help us in the decisions that we make and in our actions that we glorify you. And we pray that we can come together again to study your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.